And so here's the, uh, the toxin that we've diluted. Matt O'Neill is preparing to inject his patient with Botox. Now, O'Neill is not a medical professional. He's a biologist, and his patient is a fish. Although the fish do look a little bit younger at times, that is not our goal. The goal is to help hatchery-raised endangered native fish survive in the wild by teaching them to avoid predators. The Botox is part of an experimental research project taking place at the Arizona Game and Fish Department's Bubbling Ponds Native Fish Conservation Facility. O'Neill runs the research center, which is near Oak Creek in Cornville, Arizona. And we are tasked with uh, helping with native fish conservation. So we maintain refuge populations of several uh, endangered species, several endangered fishes. Oh yeah, lots of fish. Refuge populations are sort of like savings accounts. So the cage holds our refuge populations, and all these fish are the ones that we hold against the catastrophic loss in the wild. They protect Arizona's biodiversity against future losses caused by natural disaster, disease, or devastation by predators. In other words, they prevent endangered fish populations from being wiped out completely. So for example, the spike dates that we have here, so they used to exist across much of the, the Verde River Basin and the Gila River Basin. Um, now they're down to three uh, isolated populations. And so it doesn't take much of a wildfire to flood those areas with ash and kill every fish in that population. So one good wildfire could easily wipe out a third of the spike dates populations that exist in the world. Knowing the status of Arizona's fish populations is the first step in any conservation effort. So very silvery, big eyes. I it's very important that we know them, like, exactly what fish we have and exactly where they are. Accurate fish surveys are of course critically, critically important. So you guys will be the people who are providing the basic information that allow us to manage all the fish in the state. From time to time, O'Neill teaches game and fish interns and others who will be collecting fish population data how to identify the various species they'll encounter in the wild. When you look at gross morphology, what you're really looking at is lots of different key traits that help you identify a fish. So color, color sucks. Color is probably the worst trait that you can look at to identify a fish. So do you know how to count fin rays? No. Well, that might be a red shiner. That's a good guess. Not right. That's a good guess. <laughs> yes. There is no question that it does not go past the edge of the eye. Um, you can tell a little bit by the tail. You can definitely separate the channel from the bullhead and the flathead by the tail. After a couple of hours learning to identify fish, some students take the plunge into a research pond that's filled with a variety of species to see how many they can recognize underwater. When you go in the pond, we'll ask you to identify all the species present, and we will ask you to group the fish by size class, so 0 to 100 millimeters, 100 to 200, and 200 plus millimeters. Snorkel surveys are harder than they look, but then again, managing native fish populations is harder than you can imagine. No, we certainly have not figured it all out. All too often, hatchery-raised native fish don't survive after they're released into the wild. Take, for instance, the endangered razorback sucker. So these are the, the bubbling ponds fish hatchery razorback ponds. And over here on the plank, Frank is feeding these fish right now. And so that facility is contracted with the Bureau of Reclamation to produce uh, 12,000 razorbacks of a certain size every year. And all, many of those fish, if not all of those fish, go into the lower Colorado River system. So they're tagged, they're marked so that we can identify them when they're recaptured. But few of them survive. And so we're working with the Lower Colorado River Multi-Species Conservation Program to identify ways to improve the stocking success of razorback suckers and bunny tail. There are many reasons why fish raised in an artificial environment don't do well in the wild. For instance, they're not used to foraging because they're fed on a regular basis. And they may lack the swimming stamina needed to thrive in a flowing river because the water they're raised in is still. Bubbling Ponds researchers are working on those issues, and they're also seeking a solution to predators, by far the greatest threat of all to hatchery-raised native fish. And so again, these fish are coming from a bucket. The only other fish they've ever seen has been their own species. And so they go into the wild incredibly naive. And when I, we talk about naive, we actually mean that if you were to put a bunch of untrained bony tail into a tank and you add a bass to that tank, the bony tail will immediately swim to that bass and use it as cover. So it certainly seems that our hatchery fish do not understand what a predator is. And the likelihood of them surviving their first encounter with a predator is very low when they're swimming and using that predator as cover. I think a, a recent Bureau of Reclamation report 
suggested that about 90% of the mortality for the hatchery raised stocks is due to predators, due to the flathead catfish and due to striped bass. Bass and catfish are non-native fish. They didn't exist in Arizona until European settlers brought them here, and now they're a constant threat to native fish like bony tail. Which brings us back to Botox. So, that's the botulinum toxin. O'Neill is using it to teach these bony tail to recognize and run from predators. And so we put this on a centrifuge and spin it down to get the liquid all to the bottom. Just as he container. prepares to demonstrate the process, he gets a call from the hatchery, where another type of predator is threatening the razorback suckers. This one's of the feathered variety, and it's about to meet its match. Radio-controlled airplanes, they're the not-so-secret weapons O'Neill and research tech Josh Walters are using to deal with bothersome birds that prey on their precious fish. So we uh, quite simply take the aircraft off the ground or, or throw it into the air and chase the birds off the property. Whereas one of the other techniques that we use are uh, shotgun shells and crackers that disrupt all the animals at the hatchery, and including all the visitors as well. The aircraft really do give the birds a fright, but what's great is that, oh, he's up. We can very specifically target a single bird so that we can chase a cormorant off the property while not scaring any of the other, other ducks and the other um, waterfowl and other birds that live here. O'Neill and Walters are earning a reputation for finding creative ways to get the job done. <laughs> Sometimes their methods take the game and fish purchasing people by surprise, like the request to buy Botox. It certainly took a lot of explaining, yes. But in the end, they were sold on the science. Botox is merely a new twist on a decades-old method of training fish to recognize predators. The most simple way would be to throw a bunch of prey species, a bunch of bony tail or a bunch of razorbacks, into a tank with a predator, let the predator eat, eat a few of those fish, and then the rest of those fish would be considered trained. Trained to avoid predators because the prey fish have a chemical in their skin, an alarm pheromone that warns the other fish of danger. A fish gets eaten, the pheromone is released into the water, and other fish sense that pheromone and say, something over there is dangerous, recognize that and don't go near it again. In a small tub like this, all of the prey fish actually see the attack on their peers. But O'Neill wants to expand this research to larger ponds where not all of the prey fish will benefit from that visual cue. So he altered the experiment to include a blender and Botox. It starts by removing a bass from an anesthetic solution that temporarily paralyzes it. Then O'Neill injects the fish's jaw muscles with Botox. So we're using botulinum toxin, um, a less refined version of Botox treatments in humans, to paralyze the muscles that allow those bass to open their mouths fast enough to capture prey. After the procedure, the bass won't realize its ability to hunt is hindered. It'll act normally, chasing bony tail even though it can't eat them. Of course, the alarm pheromone is missing, so O'Neill will have to add that to the water himself. Using bony tail that are raised for science and are not genetically appropriate for stocking, O'Neill makes a powerful potion of alarm juice in the lab. All right, here is the skin off of three bony tail. Add some tank water. It's a solution of bony tail skin harvested from euthanized fish. Add the fish skin. And liquefied in a blender. Now we have a nice gray, homogenized fish skin solution. The concentrated cocktail of alarm pheromone goes into the bucket with the hindered bass. Let's go train some bony tail. Then it all goes into the pond with 20 bony tail. They immediately sense the pheromone and associate the bass with danger. And not one bony tail gets eaten in the process. This will be critically important when O'Neill starts training hundreds of big fish in very large ponds. So yes, this will prevent the loss of those uh, very valuable native fish. After five minutes with the hindered bass and the strong solution of alarm pheromone, these bony tail are considered trained. Now it's on to the survival trials. The trained bony tail are transferred to a larger pond where they'll try to survive for 24 hours with four very hungry bass. These bass have been starved for several days and they're very capable of catching and eating their prey. We put the bony tail in here, we let them sit for one hour, and then we add the bass. 
and that, and that starts a 24 hour clock. A separate 24 hour survival trial is conducted with 20 untrained bony tail. Then the researchers compare the results. So far, the data show a 75% survival rate for trained fish and a 55% survival rate for untrained bony tail. It certainly does seem promising. Promising, yes, but O'Neill says some challenges remain. One of the challenges will be expanding the training process to the pond size, to actually scaling it up to a pond setting. And so being able to train 3,000 two-foot-long razorbacks is a little bit different than training 20 six to three inch long bony tail in an eight foot pond. The other major concern is whether this will actually work in the wild. If it does work in the wild, give partial credit to a toxin that makes people look younger and helps endangered fish survive. You got one? Yeah. We might dramatically improve survival of the stocked fish.